My name is Andres Martinez. I'm the editorial director of Future Tense, and I'm a professor of practice at the Cronkite School of Journalism at uh, Arizona State University. Um, <clears throat> as many of you know, uh, Future Tense is a collaboration between New America, the DC think tank, Slate Magazine, and Arizona State University. We explore the impact of technology on society. Um, today's uh, event is going to be is going to consist of two acts. We're going to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Michael Burns. And then uh, close to the half hour, we're going to switch gears and have a uh, round table or more of these sort of Brady box discussion with uh, folks who cover the industry. And we're gonna talk about streaming, the streaming wars and where, where, all, where all that's headed. But first off, I wanna welcome Michael Burns. Um, <clears throat> Michael, really, really excited and, and happy that you could do this with us. I know you're busy. Michael is the vice chairman at Lionsgate. He is known uh, he's been in that role since 2000. He is known in the industry for helping to position Lionsgate as one of the real innovators when it comes to uh, content creation in Hollywood uh, and was involved with the, with the acquisition of <clears throat> the Stars Network and also with the, uh, the collaboration that, that Lionsgate has with Three Arts Entertainment. And I should mention here that <clears throat> we at Future Tense have a fiction project that is working closely with with Three Arts, we publish speculative fiction on Slate and work with Three Arts to try to get some of those stories adapted for other media. And that's that's a very exciting collaboration that we have that's that's going very well. Um, so I, I definitely wanted to mention that. I also saw that yesterday, um, Stars acquired uh, one of the seasons of Slow Burn, which Slate created as a podcast, the, the Watergate story. So that's, <laughs> I thought that was a, that was funny that that happened. I saw that yesterday, um, so it's another sort of tie-in. With the with the big star, Julia Roberts. Yeah, Julia Roberts, who uh, one of my Slate colleagues that uh, we're now co-workers. So I said that that was great. Um, and most important of all, I should mention, Michael, you're a Sun Devil. You're an ASU uh, alum, uh, class of 1980. So that's that's really excited, exciting. And in, in that conjunction, I wanted to ask you about. I understand you had a role. Um, as, as a as a um, active and, and influential uh, Sun Devil in Hollywood, you had a role in the, the recent announcement that ASU is going to um, have the Sydney Poitier New American Film School. This is sort of a, a relaunch uh, in a more ambitious version of a film school that the university is going to have. That's going to be centered um, in Mesa in Arizona and on our campus in the Phoenix area, but also. Um, in, in Los Angeles, in our center that uh, ASU has acquired the, the old Herald Examiner building, and we're going to have a lot of programs in downtown LA, um, which, is, which is really going to be terrific starting in a, a year or two, including the Cronkite School. But maybe just if we could just start off by, uh, if you could talk a little bit about what you think the significance is of ASU having the Sydney Poitier uh, New American Film School, your role in that. And, and it, it's sort of a, a way, it's a promotional to a certain extent for those of us at the university, but I do, I actually wanted to start this conversation with the topic of inclusive storytelling. I mean, Future Tense is all about looking at the impact of technology on things, but obviously one of the big stories of 2020 is uh, sort of this reckoning that we're having as a society on social justice, racial um, justice issues. And I think it's, if we're gonna talk about storytelling, we have to talk about whose stories are we telling? And so, um, again, thank you for being with us and it's a broad invitation to talk about that, that school and then the, the broader story of how you see the industry um, uh, taking to heart or, or not perhaps the, the lessons of 2020 and, and what kind of changes might we see in, in, in terms of whose stories uh, are we telling and who's represented on the screen. Okay, let me uh, just, uh, I had a small role in the uh... Um, and getting uh, Sidney Poitier and his family behind uh, uh, attaching their name to the film school. And that really came about uh, serendipitously, serendipitously, I can't even say that word, but anyway, what, uh, I was having dinner with my dear friend, Billy Freakin and Sherry Lansing. Sherry is the first woman to run a studio way back when. Billy is a, a director that's done some great movies, The Exorcist and, and The French Connection and you know, Live and Die in LA. Anyway, they're very dear friends of mine. And I, I would say once a month go to a dinner party at their house. This is you know before the world shut down, 
And uh, a number of years ago, I sat next to uh, Joanna and Sydney Portier and got to know them a little bit. And then, uh, then fast forward a number of years, and uh, I was talking to Michael Crow and a fellow by the name of uh, Adam Collis, who teaches out here, is great, this Film Spark program. And um, I was talking about, they were talking about, they're gonna, they bought that building in downtown LA, which is a fantastic building. And we talked about, uh, you know, what are we gonna do? How are we gonna name it? And then we talked about the Cronkite School, and then we talked about Sandra Day O'Connor, the law school. And, and they talked about, you know, inclusive and, uh, and the idea of diversity, and which I've been a big proponent of for a very long time. And the industry really has to catch up. And they said, what do you think? And I said, look, I got a name that would be great. I have no idea whether he would do it, uh, but Sidney Poitier would be fantastic. I've met him once or twice. So, you know, then they went through the, uh, the process internally and said that that would be a great addition and uh, augment the, the, the launch of the school out here and in Mesa and, and in Phoenix. So I called up Sherry and then she put me back in touch with the Potier family and, and, and I gave them the pitch of why I thought that would be fantastic. And uh, after uh, a little, a few weeks you know, back and forth and um, uh, Michael got involved and, um, and Steve Tepper got involved and, and ultimately uh, the Potier family agreed to do it. And uh, that was exciting. So that was just a small role, but I thought that was a, a great get for the university. Mm -hmm. And as far as, as far as diversity, you know, if you go back um, years and years ago, I think the industry does a terrible job uh, or has done a terrible job in the past. I think we're getting better. The Academy is getting better as far as uh, uh, people of color and, and uh, diverse uh, members. But uh, I, I uh, helped organize with Lionsgate um, an initiative with Kamala Harris, who's an old friend of mine at the time. Uh, uh, I'm not even sure she was a U.S. Senator at that point, but she uh, and I, she's a graduate of Howard University. My strong belief is to, uh, to, for us to see these candidates that ultimately enter the industry, you have to get to them early. And what I mean by that is uh, have them become interns. So I went to business school at UCLA, so work with the university there with a fellow by the name of Sanjay and Al Osborne, who was the, uh, one of the, the deans. And, and we ultimately figured out accommodation. So we, we opened up a bunch of, I think we started off with a dozen interns to predominantly black colleges, uh, Howard University, which is where Kamala went. Uh, and uh, we launched that program and it was very successful. Uh, we didn't do it obviously this uh, past summer because of the pandemic, but we think we'll continue to do that. So. And I also think if you take a look at Stars, uh, which is something a, a company that we own, uh, Stars is very much about uh, showrunners, African Americans, uh, uh, people of color, uh, and not trying to be all things to all people. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, if you look at the uh, the programming history, whether it's Power, we have an upcoming series with them called Blind Spotting. Uh, we have uh, uh, a great number of our leads in our shows are uh, people of color. And so we are uh, really, uh, really making a gigantic effort there. And, and, and the industry uh, is certainly doing their best as well, but we can all do better. Right. Um, and <clears throat> do you think that, um, well, you know, when, it's gonna be interesting to see like what are the lasting impacts of, of 2020 on, on, on so many different fronts. Um, and on, on the question of diversity and representation, um, I mean, that, that's, that's a society-wide reckoning. Um, you know, we're seeing it in, in academia, um, corporate America is, is, is um, going through, I think what's, what's a very, uh, you know, constructive, uh, Exact, you know, self-examination, and then the question is, you know, is this sort of a moment, and then it fades, or is there sort of lasting change? I mean, <laughs> and on this question, five, ten years from now, and I, 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 I was looking over the weekend at, at some of the figures of st at stars, and and clearly, um, you guys are are a standout. Um, but th this for Hollywood, this has been a question now for a number of years. You know, even prior to twenty twenty, obviously with. Um, a lot of debate around the nominations for the Oscars and, and, and so forth. And 
how, how do you think we can um, evaluate whether this will be a true, uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, there'll be a true shift as a result of the last, <clears throat> you know, year or two in Hollywood's case? Um, you know, when we're five, 10 years from now, when we look back, what are some of the, the benchmarks? I mean, I think it's, I think it's, you're, you're, you're right to say that um, a lot of this is path, involves pathways and mentoring and access for folks. Um, and obviously that's something that on the academic side, you know, President Michael Crow and ASU is very invested in. But um, as, you, as you progress, you know, five, 10 years from now, what should we be looking for um, if we are gonna evaluate um, whether the, a lot of the soul searching from 2020 really had lasting permanent impact or not? I think it's changed forever. I think that uh, we're not gonna go backwards from here. The question is how quickly we can go forward. So uh, I don't, I, what people sort of, I, I never understood why people, um, including us, I guess, didn't recognize uh, earlier, but we were a little, we were early. We, we ended up, I think we've done 20 Tyler Perry movies. When we did our first Tyler Perry movie, um, no one in Hollywood really knew who he was. I mean, he was basically selling uh, uh, DVDs out of the trunk of his car. And, you know, Tyler has now turned out to be this, this force to be reckoned with. Uh, we are doing uh, this program 1619, a bunch of different ways on, on that. That's going to be controversial on some side, but we think that that is a story that should be told that Pulitzer Prize uh, uh, winning uh, 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 series. Uh, so we feel uh, that, Take a look at the movie going population. It used to be that um, African Americans were 5% of the movie going population and call it 13% of the uh, US population. And then over the last few years, that, that, that group really started going to the movies and it was closer to, the, even though the, the, it, they stayed at the same 13% of the population, it was about 20% of the movie going population. And then when it came to genre movies, even a higher percentage, the same, same sort of trend exists with Hispanics. And, uh, uh, and so we are uh, really paying attention to this. And I think the entire industry is, and I, I don't think that's gonna change. I the same way that I think that the pandemic sort of um, shoved the uh, premium VOD uh, day and date with theaters in many cases, and, this, and now a 17 day window in many ways, I don't, I don't think that ever changes. So, you know, it's like that, uh, that, that Latin expression, ex me lo bonum, out of bad comes good. And I think that, uh, you know, that in this current scenario, that, that a fair amount of good is going to come out of a bad. Thanks. And, you know, obviously we could, we could spend more than an hour on, on this topic of, of diversity, but um, I do want to shift gears and touch upon um, what, what you were also getting at when you, when we think about what, what's going to remain with us um, from the, the, the previous year. And in the case of the pandemic, the sort of behavioral changes that were sort of forced upon us by circumstance. Um, you know, I think uh, when we talk about the future of entertainment, a question that's uppermost in everyone's <laughs> mind, is you know are are we all going to go back to to the movie theaters with the same gusto that we you know used to go in 2018 2019 or is some of the sort of behavioral shift going to you know when you're making your planning do you assume that we're going to go back to that or is it going to be more that going to the movie theaters is going to become a rare treat that we're going to reserve for, for very special occasions even once the all clear is sounded whenever that is on the on the sort of public health front how do you, how do you think of that I think that people are going to go back to the movies. I think people are sick of being trapped in their houses. Uh, I can tell you that kids kind of find them that they, they believe they're bulletproof. I think the vaccine is certainly going to help a lot. And I, I think that if you look for le leading indicators, you know, look at, you don't have to look farther than the box office in China last weekend. Mm -hmm. So, and, and so you're, you're just seeing huge numbers at some of these countries that are reopening. Oh, really? And, uh, I think that uh, people will go back. I think that, you know, the w one of the fastest growing uh, demographics for theater going was um, uh, older Americans. I'm reading this book right now, 2030 by this professor out of uh, Wharton. And uh, he was talking about, um, uh, you know, the uh, aging population uh, and it is aging in this country. And, uh, and, and, you know, you're seeing population growing Pretty significantly in places like Africa, but not so much in America. So this, 
this grain American population is going to be a, is going to be a, a story for some time. Uh, and I think that that part of the population, the older Americans are probably, I think it's very vaccine dependent in many mm-hmm. ways to returning. Kids are going to turn uh, come back in droves is my take. And, and, and I think maybe, maybe they're going to be sick. I hope that's the case with my 14 year old. I hope that they're sick of video games. <laughs> Although I, I understand Lionsgate is also in, in, in the gaming space, right? We are in the gaming space, but it's more about licensing our intellectual property, like John Wick. Um, we're not, I wouldn't consider us uh, game developers. We're, uh, uh, again, using the, the world-class IP that we have and, and figuring out a way to, to monetize that and create uh, great content, typically with a partner. Mm-hmm. In, in a lot of your, in your materials describing the the collection of, of, you know, content properties that, that is Lionsgate. You talk about the, you know, the feature film division and, and television. And is, are, are we, are we going to get to the point where the, the sort of boundaries between TV and film are going to collapse into one? It, it's sort of, and maybe again, I'm still hung up on the sort of the, the experience of it on streaming where, where I feel like it's becoming a very fuzzy line, but well, yeah, no, that's true. Uh, you know, I was thinking about, we have a sh- popular show on Netflix, Dear White People, that started out as a film for us. Mm-hmm. Uh, Blind Spotting, which I think will be a hit on Stars, uh, again, was a feature film start, uh, project for us that segued now into a, to a television series. Intellectual property is intellectual property, and, and great intellectual property can play in, in many, different, uh, many different ways, and it, it never seems to die. I mean, we're doing another... Dirty Dancing, actually, with uh, Jennifer Grey, uh, who was an old pal of mine. But so there's a uh, there's certainly an opportunity uh, to reformat, recreate, reimagine uh, great intellectual property, and and we're doing that. There's a, and, and their authors were big up big on source material. We're shooting with Mark Forrester. The last movie we did with Mark Forrester, uh, he directed Monsters Ball for us. Now, 20 years later, he's doing the follow up to Wonder, which is called White Bird. We're shooting that in. The Czech Republic. So uh, I think that that uh, you'll always have that opportunity. You know, in, in terms of the what's happening domestically and, and talking about representation, you were, you were talking about, you know, I think you were suggesting that in, in some ways the market forces are also playing a role because, um, you know, studios should cater to and the content creators should cater to who the audience is. And it's fascinating to me how um, you know, when you think about um, the sort of global picture, and you were, I think you were, you were alluding to this too, the, um, it's an industry that, that is, you know, fully globalized. I, I was looking at some numbers, because as I mentioned earlier to you, I'm teaching a class on sport and globalization, and sport is an industry that's not globalized the way Hollywood is. I mean, it, I, th- I think prior, the year prior to the pandemic, about three quarters of box office revenue for big Hollywood studios came from overseas. Um, and in 1990, it was only like 35%. So, and the U.S. economy accounts for about 24% of the world's economy. So that is kind of, you know, as it should be, um, that three quarters come from outside. Um, but what, my, I guess one question I have is, how is that um, affecting the kind of content that, um, that you're making for me? Um, and how is that changing sort of your entire approach to what you do? Well, I, we're always looking at, you know, co- content from, you know, from a movie standpoint, obviously you want it to work in this market first, uh, but you have, uh, uh, you definitely take a look at how that something will play around the world. And that could be either television shows or content, the this, this show power that we have on, uh, uh, on stars and the power universe is a giant hit also in, uh, in the UK. Uh, I'm also a believer, as I said, I'm reading this book and and it's 2030. I'm a huge believer and there's a giant opportunity in Africa, particularly as, uh, as uh, uh, mobility gets there and, and uh, you don't have to worry about the infrastructure of cable being later for that matter, uh, fiber optics. So uh, we're looking at all of that, but there are shows, you know, we're, we're, we're basing a show. I watched a show last night, which was terrific. Not my show uh, called industry, which is on HBO. Mm-hmm. And, you know, then you'll also set shows in um, uh, another great show. You should watch it, particularly if you're interested in sports. I don't know if you've seen Ted Lasso. 
I love but it. It's 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 terrific, you know. But you've got that, you know. You get a little bit of the UK and you know, a lot of uh, Americana, and so that is a. Uh, so there's more of that going to continue to go on. We're looking at. I think it wouldn't be surprising to see stars uh, producing one or two shows a season, uh, local content in that particular uh, country. Because you want to have, yes, you want to have American films and American television shows, and uh, but you also want to have uh, local content, whether it be library productable movies or also uh, brand new shows that are, are that are being shot uh, in that particular region. So, so one thing I I um, know I don't quite understand to the extent that I'm sure my colleagues who are going to um, join in a discussion for the second segment who follow the industry. To me, it's it's um, it feels like so you have this this studio which produces shows and I'm sure some of them you produce for your stars network but you also sell a lot of your movies and t television shows to other platforms and I wonder um, is that kind of model something that is going to become um, anachronistic it feels like uh, you know Netflix creating its own content and then you know, uh, NBC Universal creating Peacock and saying, well, we don't want The Office on Netflix anymore. Let's let's keep it all within our bailiwick here. It, it feels like we're recreating sort of like the early days of, you know, in a very high tech manner, but the early days of sort of like the, the, the marriage of, of content and distribution and the studio systems. And, you know, are we going to get to the to a point where there's going to be sort of the Amazon Prime universe of, of creators who can only play in that sandbox and Netflix and Peacock and uh, HBO Max. And, and where do you, is that a threat or an opportunity for you? I, I just, um, how is this going to play itself out in the next five, 10 years? I think that you're going to see, um, again, remember that we sort of like to zig when we're, everybody else is zagging. So I've been quoted years and years ago, which is we want to be a um, uh, benevolent arms deal in the world of content. So um, what I mean by that is that we'll make shows, develop shows that could ultimately end up on stars or they could end up on uh, uh, on Hulu or they could end up on Apple Plus. We have shows basically everywhere. A great show, by the way, called Mythic Quest on Apple Plus. A really terrific show. And, and then uh, we have obviously something like Zoe's Extraordinary Playlist on NBC. And we just announced we're doing First Ladies, which was with, with Showtime. So we are uh, uh, capitalists, but we for a show that we think fits very well on stars, they, they usually uh, have a pretty good crack at getting that show. And stars is now in 52 countries uh, outside of America. So uh, I think that we are going to continue to see others hoard their own product for their own platform. And that bodes well for us because what that means is that our library continues to get more valuable because everybody's desperate to have that, that product uh, uh, on their platform because they're selling advertising against it. Um, and that, that gives us a pretty good opportunity to have multiple bids. So when you have, you don't have to be an economics major to know that when you have limited supply and increased demand, uh, mm -hmm. that usually uh, works out pretty well for the, for the, uh, uh, for the controller of that content. That, so we have the opportunity to license that uh, much more frequently and at higher prices uh, than we ever have in the past. And do you think, do you, I, I, that makes sense that it, it might bode well for you. Do you think it'll bode well for sort of the quality of television across the, the board? Um, I mean, we, it's, you know, a lot of people like to say we're living in the golden age of, of TV. And, and I guess we've been saying that for a while. And you've mentioned some, you know, going back to like Mad Men, which, which you all were responsible for. And, you know, we could go on and on. It's just, it, there's just amazing. There's not enough time to watch all the great stuff um, that's available. Um, but, at, you know, if, if a lot of these studios start hoarding their, their own stuff and lock down talent in long-term exclusive deals, my, is, do you think there's a danger that that could affect the quality of offerings if people are kind of, um, you know, <laughs> locked into uh, different bailiwicks and can't collaborate with each other? Or is each one of these universes diverse and large enough that that's not a, an issue? I mean, back in the day, the, you know, the, 
the U.S. government decided that, that this uh, um, vertical integration constituted an antitrust problem. And I guess there's plenty of arguments these days to be made that it's a, it's a different world. We're not talking about studios owning actual physical movie theaters, but conceptually, I guess, you know, you could draw some analogies. Um, are you optimistic about kind of like that this golden age will continue to flourish and we'll see more of it or are there looming threats to, to that? I, I don't think it's, I think it's, you know, you talked about the golden age of content. I don't think it's a golden age of movie stars or television stars. I think it's the, it's, it's now the golden age of writers and showrunners, talented writers and showrunners, because if you take a look at the hit shows uh, that are out there um, and, you know, great, uh, great television, which I think has got some of the best writing in the history of the business right now, but you have, look at the, no one knew anybody on the Mad Men cast when that show launched. And I could give you example after example, when you're our, our lead again, and it's always extraordinary playlist. No one had ever, um, maybe it's been seen her in a few small parts, but not exactly a, a recognizable star she is now. So we have, um, uh, again, if you have the right, I watched a pilot we did the other night, um, called Minx. It's a, just a, a great pilot. And I think we'll probably have a, a lot of interest from a lot of different places for that. So I think that it's not so much about uh, the movie stars getting tied up or the television stars getting tied up. It's about uh, finding, finding the right platform for them. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and then also the, the, the reason that I think that there's availability and whether why these a lot of people are doing these shows even like for example julia roberts is going to do the show that you mentioned earlier for us uh where she's playing martha mitchell that uh you know it's not a you know it's not like the old days it's not a seven eight year commitment so we'll do the the limited series and in some cases uh, it'll be uh those series will be extended if everybody wants to do it like for example the the Big Little Lies, and, and I think that started off as one season, and now it's going into season four. So that is a uh, that's the, that's the new uh, way that uh, that television shows are sort of you know exploding. So you mentioned that Stars is not trying to be um, all things to all people, and that in some ways can lead to, to sort of some um, you know real cutting edge, uh, interesting programming. But you know, wait, wait, as as a Hollywood power broker, leader, big shot, pick your term, like how many um, streaming services do, do folks like you in Hollywood expect, you know, the rest of us to, to subscribe to? I mean, what, what is, uh, this is, <laughs> I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be four or five. Four or five. I, um, I, I watched the television show the other night that my, my son, my 12 year old wanted to watch this show and it was on discovery. And I hadn't watched this television show with a lot of commercials in a long time. It was exhausting. Dark. It was exhausting. Um, but if you take a look at uh, what's happening, that you know people are now, it's ingrained in them to watch these non-commercials, high-end, premium content uh, without without uh, commercial breaks. So I, you know, if I again, I don't. No one knows anything. That's that's in, including me. But I will tell you that I do believe that people will subscribe to four or five video services if there are shows on that 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 service that they love and, and they fall in love with. It's, a, it's like Stars is, again, not trying to be anything to all people. They were looking, the whole strategy was to deliver great shows to audience who had previously been overlooked. And you know, that could have been women. You know, we thought there was an opportunity with a show like Outlander, which does incredibly well, or Spanish Princess or White Princess. So um, we're trying to find uh, the right uh, product for, for audiences that are desperate to find the kind of shows that they want. I, I like Netflix a lot, but I was banging around there the other day trying to figure out if there's anything else I wanted to watch. And I ended up, uh, I ended up subscribing uh, to Hulu uh, because I wanted to watch this show um, uh, the industry. So, and so I'd heard so much about it. And then I will be, I'm sure I will be on Hulu for a while, um, uh, watching shows that are available on, on Hulu. I think I saw a show, um, I can't remember if it was the great or maybe normal people, but, uh, the writing. And again, if you look at those shows that are, that look at normal people, you've never seen either one of those two actors. 
mm-hmm. and that we have that show overseas for um, uh, for stars. But again, this is a you know a brand new set of actors um, that uh, responded to the material. It was based on a book. Yeah, yeah it's amazing. I, I've I've had to sign up to two streaming services that I had no intention of signing up to because of this because of they got me with the sport. So like CBS went off and acquired the Champions League rights. Um, I'm a soccer fan. And so suddenly I, I have to add CBS. So that was, and, and then Peacock with the, with the Premier League. Um, but I mean, I, I guess the last question uh, related to this is, uh, is, the, is the next trend gonna be that we're gonna, we're gonna have sort of uh, uh, streaming bundlers coming on to, to yeah, help? No, it, 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 yeah, if you saw what YouTube announced the other day, which was four or five, premium services uh, bundled at YouTube TV. Uh, that is a precursor of what's gonna happen. So I think what happens, again, I preface this by saying that no one knows anything, but it certainly looks like history is repeating itself like the old cable companies, which is, I think you'll see, somebody will say, I, I like a show on Stars. I like, uh, I like a show on HBO. Um, I want a music service. So I'm gonna have Apple or Spotify or YouTube music or Amazon music. And uh, I'm gonna, I also like a, a show, I like Apple Plus. And so I think you'll have four or five. I think it'll be a, a couple of these guys, including us, will get together and say, hey, we'll be part of the bundle. So um, mm-hmm. maybe not get as high economics if somebody bought it directly, but it will lower churn dramatically. People don't like getting four or five bills and forgetting that they've subscribed to something. So for sure, uh, there will be uh, these mini bundles of over the top services. And I believe that um, stars will be a part of many of those. And if you can lower the churn, which is fairly significant because a lot of people say, all right, I wanna watch my show. I'm done with my show. I move on. I come back when the show comes back on the air. So th- that is, uh, that's gonna be the future. That's why those many bundles are gonna, are gonna happen. It's funny, it, it does sound Suspiciously like the old cable operators. <laughs> his, his <laughs> history, history repeats itself. The last question, I, I, can't, I can't let you go without uh, having you tell us your favorite TV show and your favorite movie of all time. Well, movies are, uh, look, I love, I'm sort of a sucker for nostalgia. I love It's a Wonderful Life. I love Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, the Cinema Paradiso, you know, fantastic. I like some of the series. I love the John Wick series for us. Um, you know, I, uh, those are just a few of my movies, um, television series I've discovered recently, um, because we're all stuck at home. I thought Peaky Blinders was fabulous. Mm-hmm. And I thought that that show was great. As I mentioned, I liked the great as well. I liked, uh, like normal people. And, um, I started watching the industry last night, which I'm, I'm, I'm very, uh, excited about There's There's a show on stars. It's kind of dark. It's sort of the underbelly of Cape Cod called High Town. Uh, that show's coming back for its second season. It's it's superb, violent, but superb. And uh, I did like Ted Lasso very much. I thought it was very heartfelt. Yeah, it was it was it was a great antidote to the uh, pandemic. If you like wow. that show, if you like that show, the same sort of mentality. Watch um, watch Mythic Quest on uh, Apple Plus. That's that's our show on Apple. Well, Michael, um, time has flown by, uh, and uh, I know you're you're busy. Um, we're going to shift. Gears. We're all busy. We're all busy. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for being with us. And we'll keep, we're going to keep watching and, and maybe we can have a conversation like this like, again in, in uh, a year or two and see where things are. Thank you so much for having me. Well, thanks a lot. Bye, you uh, guys. Bye-bye. So we're going to now have our second conversation um, with uh, a stellar panel of people who know a lot more about uh, entertainment today and tomorrow than I do. Uh, so if you want to Go ahead. Um, I was joking earlier that when we used to do events live, this is when uh, these folks would be coming up to the stage and taking their seats. Now they just have to turn on their camera. So with me is Brandon Tensley. He's the national. He's a national politics writer for CNN, uh, focused on the intersection of culture and politics. Um, if Michael Burns is an alum of ours on the ASU side, um, Brandon is an alum on the New America side. He he was. Uh, with, with our team at New America a while back. And it's, it's great to see you again, Brandon. Um, and Tara La- LaChapelle is a Bloomberg uh, opinion columnist and has writes a lot about the industry and about streaming and uh, sort of 
uh, big mergers and, and deals um, in the industry and, and also beyond. And Bryn Sandberg is a senior writer at The Hollywood Reporter, um, so also very well versed um, on these topics. So uh, really, really excited that we can, we can uh, uh, flesh through some of these issues and, and really eager to hear from you kind of where you see things going. Um, Brandon, why don't I start with you? Um, how many streaming services do you have? Oh man, that's a that's a good question. Um, let me think. So HBO Max, Netflix, Hulu, Disney Plus, um, four. I think that sounds about right. Um, so I actually I feel like that's actually like pretty much on average. I think I read something that said that the average number of people that uh, people on average have, I think, four subscriptions uh, to these sorts of services. Um, uh, but I feel like you know, sort of like what Michael Burns was saying, my, I sort of gravitate toward different ones. Like there'll be a period where I'm very much on Hulu, um, you know, like last summer um, when I was sort of like getting into old teen dramas from like the nineties, you know, Hulu has Dawson's Creek, it has Buffy the Vampire Slayer. So I spent a lot of time on Hulu. Um, and then sometimes, you know, Disney Plus will add something. They added Cinderella with Whitney Houston and Brandy. So I was on that a couple of weeks ago for, you know, nostalgia. Uh, so yeah, I definitely sort of migrate between platforms depending on what's up there. And Tara and Bryn, are you guys in the four-ish ballpark or over under? Well, I have to use all of them for my job. So covering the streaming space, you have to test them all out. But I think like a lot of people, Netflix has become my sort of base subscription. It's the one I naturally turn on first. And I think that shows the power of Netflix and yeah. the challenge for these other companies in trying to unseat Netflix as that sort of main subscription that you just can't see a reason to unsubscribe to. Yeah. Yeah, I will second that. I, I feel like um, I've always had Netflix and and just, I feel like casually amongst my friends, it's sort of known every, it's sort of the assumption is that everybody has Netflix and then it's like, what what services do you add on top of that? Um, and, and, and I will also echo what Brandon was saying. I do migrate between different services at different times. I had Disney Plus at one point. Um, got rid of it. I plan to get it again when the next, you know, big show comes out that I'm interested in watching. Um, same with Hulu. I think they had the Britney Spears doc recently that everyone was talking about. And I was like, oh, got to get back on that. So I think that's sort of the way that until there's some sort of, you know, mini cable, you know, new cable bundle, like you were, like you and Michael were talking about, I think that's what um, people might do. Yeah. It's, it's, it's interesting, this question of, of what, what the, you know, whether we can assume that there's a default service that, you know, um, can be sort of a shared water cooler, even though on that platform, we, we might not still be watching the same shows, but, and I, I run into this in teaching, I'm uh, teaching a course this semester and wanted to sign some, some documentaries and, but, you know, I don't want like students to have to uh, pay for things on top of everything else. And, but it's like, is it reasonable to assign something that's on Netflix? And it feels like kind of, cause Probably, but you know, you don't want to over assume, you don't want to, um, but Tara, why don't, um, there's so many ways we could, we could get into this, but I'm very intrigued. You, you've been writing and uh, about Roku <laughs> and of all the names in this ecosystem that Roku is one I know nothing about. And it keeps kind of like, you just, you feel like it's, it's, it feels very 2013 or something, but then it keeps popping back. And, and it might be an example of like the, this convergence of, uh, entities that we associate with content on, on one side and then it's, and then hardware technology plays kind of like changing lanes. I don't know what, what is the Roku story tell us about larger trends, if, if anything, and what is the Roku story in, in a minute? Sure. So, so you're right that Roku really started as a hardware company. They sold the Roku player, which then became the Roku stick. But the, the main thing that they do is they have an operating system and it's one of the more popular operating systems that's on smart TVs now. And so just like you have the ecosystem with Apple TV and Amazon Fire, Roku is a competitor. And in fact, Roku is, has a significantly larger share than either of those companies. It's the leader in this space. But like you said, there's a lot of cross-pollination happening. Everyone's eyeing the money attached to content and advertising, as Michael Burns kind of referenced. Uh, so Roku is really betting their future growth on something called the Roku Channel, which is a free streaming service. 
And the idea is it's supported by advertising. So you don't have to pay anything for it. There's no subscription. As long as you have either a Roku television or a Roku stick, you can stream for free. Is it the stuff that you want to see? That's the big question. A lot of these free ad supported services like Pluto and Tubi, you know, they're, they're not premium. They're not Netflix. They're not Disney plus, but you don't have to pay for them. They're really convenient. So that's where these companies are trying to segue. Uh, Roku so far has been very successful in, in telling at least Wall Street investors this story. They're worth almost $60 billion. So uh, it's just a matter of what is this, you know, how does it shake out in the future? Just as you guys were just talking about, you know, how many apps, how many services and, and how many devices are people going to have? Well, and the other interesting thing is that Quibi just recently acquired, or sorry, Roku acquired Quibi's library, right? In, in an attempt to, to have some more original content. And, and so uh, Bryn, thinking about the, the, the takeaways from 2020, this crazy year we had um, and the ongoing pandemic, um, what, what, would you, what would be your best guess about, um, you know, some of the shifts that will be permanent um, in terms of our behavior, in terms of how the industry does things, um, uh, maybe it's maybe it's an acceleration of trends. But you know, if we're sitting here in 2025, 2030, saying, "Well, this 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 is a result of that uh, pandemic we went through." Like, what what do you think is going to stick? Well, I think, and this is something that, of course, you Michael brought up just the the you know straight to to streaming um you know movies going straight to you know direct to consumer as opposed to um having that theatrical window and i think that that is actually an acceleration of uh you know a trend that we were already seeing and i think in in some ways a lot of these major some of these major studios were, were really wanting to to do that for some time and the pandemic sort of gave them the perfect excuse to, to accelerate that. We saw that with Warner Brothers um, and putting a lot of their, you know, major release, theatrical releases this year, you know, direct to um, HBO Max and then also giving them, uh, putting them in theaters as well. But of course, you know, if, if, you know, we're still in this pandemic, who knows how long exactly it's going to last, um, you know, most people are going to feel safer probably watching that from the comfort of their own home with their own family or their own, you know, pods and not um, putting themselves at risk. But we also saw that that um, that really frustrated some some top talent. Um, some of their you know biggest directors and stars were saying, "Hey, you know, we we made this project eyeing you know the big screen. We want you know especially with somebody like." Denny um, Villeneuve making Dune, you know, that was a movie that that he wanted to have in theater, wanted people to be able to watch it in theaters um, and not on, on a small screen at first. Um, and so then that set off this sort of um, these negotiations with with top talent and and Warner Brothers sort of trying to appease them and, and say, you know, this is just what we have to do during this time. But I do think that that we're going to see that continue. I love that part of the uh, one of the the Reddit investment, uh, the subreddits on around Wall Street bets. One of their target sort of nostalgia stocks was was AMC, which which felt representative of, of something. Um, and uh, Michael Burns was very seemed very bullish at the idea uh, that we were, were all going to rush back to theaters. Um, <clears throat> Brandon, are, are you going to rush back to, to theaters, or what's your what's your sense of of how we're going to change our ways permanently as a result of this year, or if at all? Yeah, so I'm, I'm absolutely gonna run back to theaters. Um, uh, I, was, I was just thinking about this the other week where, you know, one thing I love about where I live in DC is I'm, you know, a 15 minute walk from uh, one of the, uh, one of the sort of indie theaters, well, theaters that play sort of like indie movies, but it also plays sort of the tentpole movies as well. Um, and it has like a nice sort of like bar area inside. Mm -hmm. Um, and so you can sort of, if you go with a bunch of friends, you can talk about the movie afterward, you know, it has this sort of communal feel. Um, and that's something that you, I don't think that you can replicate, you know, no matter how many um, uh, streaming services you sign up for, um, there are things that you just can't uh, sort of put into somebody's apartment or put into a sort of uh, virtual experience. Um, and, you know, I, I think I agreed with what uh, Michael Burns was saying that, you know, the pandemic's only going to go on but for so long i think before um people start feeling comfortable and safe uh going back to theaters they're they're sort of tired of just sort of having to do everything virtually like over zoom um you know netflix party things like that you know they can only 
only bring but so much joy, I think, before people are ready to, to go back to uh, something that feels a little, a little more personal, a little more communal. Um, so uh, in terms of trends, you know, I, I hope, I, I think the, the bigger worry might be, you know, whether theaters, certain theaters can survive mm -hmm. um, as opposed to uh, whether people want to go back to theaters. Um, I think those are slightly two different things, um, but I don't think that people are going to all of a sudden, you know, from a year of being cooped up at home, be like, oh, I'm done with theaters. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm with you on that. Um, do, do you, Brandon, um, buy into this? Um, I mean, the term sounds kind of hokey, but I, I, I sort of instinctively I'm willing to go along with it of, of a golden age of TV, just in terms of like the quality that we have. But does that resonate um, with you? And, and as you think of like all of these streaming services and um, all these choices, and I, I, I was struck by Michael, you know, saying that stars is not trying to be all things to all people. Um, how do you sense the, the landscape in terms of like the, the, the variety of content and whether um, you feel like we're, we have enough choice and enough, I mean, this connects to the diversity mm -hmm. issue we are also talking about um, because, uh, or, or are there still like big avenues that are not being pursued for lack of um, opportunities or how do, how do you how do you think about that? Yeah, I'll, I'll try to summarize it uh, succinctly. But you know, I think that there are are a couple of different pieces. I think there's the quantitative aspect, which I feel like um, you guys were talking about in the earlier conversation about sort of um, who are the people sort of um, who are signing up to work on these different projects. Um, and there's also the qualitative aspect in terms of you know what are the actual stories that are being portrayed. Um, I think that that's something that uh, you know that can't be put into numbers necessarily. Um, I think a sort of easy example is, you know, when Hidden Figures came out several years ago, you know, it was a movie that I, I loved seeing in theaters. I remember the first time I tried to see it, it was actually sold out. Um, and, you know, it's a very sort of warm, heartfelt movie. Um, and there's also just that very sort of um, infamous scene, for lack of a better word, um, where somebody, you know, desegregates the bathrooms with a crowbar. Um, that was very much not true. <laughs> um, and it sort of goes back to, you know, there are still these sorts of um, negotiations, I guess, about, you know, if we want to have this sort of movie, then we also need to still on some level cater to a particular sort of um, narrative or audience or, or whatever. Um, and so I think that's something that might be a little bit harder to, um, maybe not harder, but something that is less obvious uh, to certain, to some viewers to address as we talk about, you know, diversity on screen, um, but it's something that I think can be helped, you know, not just by saying like, oh, we're telling a story about, um, you know, some particular uh, racial racial or ethnic group, um, but also like who is actually behind sort of like writing that, producing that, um, what kind of input do, do the actors have, um, those sorts of things. Um, so, you know, I, I do think that I agree with Michael Burns. I do think that it's, it's, it's getting better um, you know, I just, I spent all of the weekend watching, uh, It's a Sin on HBO, well, just arrived on HBO Max, we came out in the UK about a month ago, and I thought it was fantastic, and, you know, the sort of story that I think is just, it's, it's wrenching, but also, um, very funny and sensual, and, you know, there were some actual laugh out loud moments and things like that, um, you know, who knows how widespread that will become in terms of, you know, pink, becoming a point of conversation, I can't imagine that, you know, regrettably, like people are going to be like, yay, a British <laughs> produced uh, movie about like the AIDS crisis or a series about the AIDS crisis is going to have a lot of um, sort of mainstream momentum, but I hope it does, uh, because it's, it's the perfect example of being masterfully well made, brilliant performances, a great soundtrack, all these different components that go into um, having that sort of content. Um, but it's also a matter of, um, I think, you know, does it have the sort of institutional uh, sort of backing? Does it have people um, sort of talking about the movie, talking about the series and, um, you know, how it's different on a bunch of different levels. Um, so, you know, I am, I am hopeful and I think it's getting better. Um, uh, but I think that there also, um, there's also a ways to go. I'm <clears throat> looking at the, um, some of the questions from the audience and apologies, I haven't been very good at getting to these, um, but they do overlap a lot with, but, but Allison Hinchman, um, who's watching on Zoom, has a question about um, somewhat related in terms of like when we talk about diversity, but again, sort of on the on the on the global from a global perspective, 
She's asking how um, you panelists see the growth of foreign streaming services like Viki, which I confess I'm not familiar with, and Cocoa, Kosoa. Um, well, I mean, again, I'm not familiar with that one. Impacting the American entertainment industry. So foreign streaming services. Um, and <clears throat> Tara, Bryn, I mean, feel free to weigh in on, on uh, what Brandon was talking about and also, uh, you know, this this the sort of give and take and the influence of of foreign streaming services and also the demand for for programming um, overseas and 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 you know you you guys are are in touch with people in the industry a lot we heard michael's perspective but um feel free to add anything you want um on that question that i posed to him about you know <clears throat> how heart you know, how much will the industry take to heart a lot of what, you know, we wrestled with as a society in 2020 in terms of um, making, you know, lasting changes and addressing issues of diversity and representation. So big question with both sort of like the domestic and, and foreign angle, but um, Tara, you want to, you want to go first? Uh, Brenner Brandon might be a better place to answer sort of the, the content perspective and like the decision making around that, but from what I've seen on sort of the, the corporate business side is that it's going to take diversity and representation in the highest ranks of these studios and these companies in order to solve the other issue, which is how we figure out how we make money from streaming, how this becomes a sustainable industry and a business. And, you know, for so long, it's been such an exclusive group of people running this space. And the more that you bring in other people into this industry, the better these services are gonna be, the better chance you have of building something that really serves the masses because right now they're struggling with all of these niche services and the prices that come along with them. And no one's really figured out a way on how to reach everybody. And the international market is going to be extremely important which is why Netflix and Disney Plus are putting so much effort into that. So that's kind of how I see it from that perspective. Thanks, Brent. Yeah, and I would say as far as the 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 content, the the foreign st streaming services question, I'm not familiar with those two that um, that were mentioned. But um, what I do know is that the streamers, particularly Nef Netflix, are very invested in growing globally. I mean, if you look at Netflix, they you know their their d domestic growth has sort of um, you know slowed, and and they're really looking at growing overseas. And what that has meant for them is actually investing in um local language originals so they you know they have offices all over the world they um i think they built I'm trying to remember the last i know they built um a big headquarters i think in spain and you know they 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 have these secondary offices where they have people who live there speak the language you know know the culture um and and are creating content that's going to appeal to to those viewers um so i know that that's definitely a huge huge growth area um, for the streamers and I think will continue to be. Um, as far as the, the question about diversity, uh, the one thing I wanted to add was, I feel like conversations that I have had with um, agents, managers, you know, people in Hollywood who are, who are getting people jobs, they will tell me that they feel like they're out, outwardly, there's a desire from expressed by the studios um, and, the, and the streamers to, you know, want to um, hire people of color and tell um, their stories. But then also behind the scenes, you have, uh, you know, when they're actually staffing a show, say they're looking for writers and a manager says, hey, I have this, you know, um, you know, this person, uh, a, a, you know, writer of color who is who would be great. And they want to know, well, what have they what have they done? And, and so you sort of have to have already gotten the work to be able to, to get the job. It's this catch 22. Right. Um, and so they're sort of frustrated saying, well, you have to give people to, you know, you got to let people get their foot in the door and then they can, they can, you know, grow into that, that person for you. But how are you are saying you want to do this? Um, but, but you're not really doing it so that I just wanted to bring up that that is that, that tension is still very much there. Um, and I think will continue to, to be there unfortunately. Right. And really quickly that like that actually reminds me of the example of, um, you know, Judas and the Black Messiah just came out um, a couple of weeks ago on HBO Max. And, you know, it has this really interesting, frustrating sort of backstory in terms of, you know, uh, Shaka King, the director um, has said how long it took to get that movie made in terms of um, getting um, studio backing and things like that. Um, even though, you know, 
Ryan Coogler, who directed um, Black Panther, um, was one of the producers, even though another producer was uh, backing, uh, f funding about half of the movie. Um, but still you hear these uh, questions of, you know, like, oh, like, even if this story resonates domestically in the US, is this something that's going to appeal to an international market? Um, which, you know, sort of uh, papers over the fact that, you know, the, the, Black, Pan the, the Black Panthers were a, were a global phenomenon, right? Um, you know, it's a history that, uh, uh, that took place in a lot of different uh, national contexts. Um, so very much like what Bren was saying, it's like, you know, you can come sort of, you know, prepared, um, you know, have, you know, you're fully prepared to uh, present this movie idea, um, but still, you know, people are just, I think, hesitant to actually, uh, to, to go into, into creating it. And I think that speaks right. more to sort of uh, various sort of ingrained biases about uh, whether we, whether people think that this is, the right time for a movie, whether it's, uh, whether people will like this movie, um, you know, a lot of things in, in, in scare quotes, uh, because I, I, I think, you know, people say one thing, um, but they're actually operating um, according to something else. Yeah, that's very true. Um, one thing that it's, you know, we have about four minutes here and I, I can't believe I ha we haven't gotten into this, but, you know, when we think of who the players are and, and Tara was, you know, uh, reminding us that Roku was, you know, initially in the hardware side and now they're, but, you know, when you step back and you look at the streaming services, of course, it's kind of like the, um, you know, the old California industry civil war between Northern California tech companies and content, Hollywood, Southern California. They're all kind of mixed in now. And Amazon and Apple, um, you know, I think I feel like people who cover these things often talk about Apple Amazon, perhaps to a lesser extent, but certainly Apple is like they're kind of dabbling in this, you know, and. And you know they they can afford to dabble in anything they want, and it it helps the brand and it gets people to use their devices, although they're going to use their devices anyway. Um, but there's always a sense that you know they are, uh, you know they can outspend anybody. I mean they can, um, and if if they really wanted to to make this you know less of a hobby and more of their like one of their core businesses, watch out traditional studios in Southern California. Um, uh, what what are y'all's thoughts on that? On like the you know the weirdness of having like you know Silicon Valley tech companies and and I guess Amazon, which however we want to describe it, kind of entering that space, being a player, but maybe not fully deciding to to own the space. I mean, how, how is that going to shake out? Tara, do you have thoughts on that? Yeah, it's funny, you can almost flip it around and say, you know, because of their sheer size and financial prowess, they get away with offering kind of subpar offerings, you know, Apple TV plus doesn't have a whole lot on it. And, you know, they came up to the market yeah. with this. Uh, yeah, Ted Lasso. But, um, you know, I, I think because these companies just they're so smart and they know that they don't have to rush into this the way that the cable net network operators do and businesses that are heavily tied to the box office, they can kind of just tiptoe and see where this goes. Because, like I said, no one has figured out how this becomes a profitable, long term profitable venture. And so they're just not really in a rush. And that takes me back to just, you know, one point on the movie theaters. I think that when we're when they're looking at, you know, Apple and Amazon are looking at the future of this industry. I think the reason people are so bullish on streaming and less so on movie theaters comes back to this idea that, you know, a lot of people like the movies, but it would seem to me that the number of people who profess sort of emotional attachment to or cultural importance of movie theaters is disproportionate, disproportionate to the number of people who actually regularly go. And that was a trend over the last 20 years and the pandemic just kind of intensified that, but it didn't start it. So I think that's why these streamers are just waiting to see, you know, what, what's the next stage of that? How quickly does this transition happen back to the living room where we're kind of building our own in-house movie theaters with big screen TVs and sound bars and things like that. Um, Bryn and, and then Brandon on. Yeah, I, well, there's that. I feel like there's always that joke going around about how, you know, Amazon just wants you to buy more toilet paper. And so they're just using their shows to get you to buy more things on Prime. Um, I don't know how much truth there is to that, but I do think that they, this is a, you know, a relatively small uh, project for them when you look at the, the you know, the size of their, their, their company and same with Apple. The other thing that I was going to mention that I think is, is, is more challenging for, for those two is that they, they don't have, 
a library of content. Like when Disney, you know, launched Disney, Disney plus they could, they just brought all their old movies and show, you know, got, got them back from wherever they were, they were streaming Netflix, Hulu, wherever. And then they launched with this, you know, they had this, you know, huge arsenal. And then you look at Amazon and, and Apple and they have had to build, of course, Amazon's had a, a bit more time, but when Apple launched, it was pretty underwhelming, I think. I mean, they had morning show, they had, you know, they had the big stars in a, in a couple projects, but they did not have the, you know, the, the library that you would need to have consumers stick around. So that's something that they're going to continue. And especially as you mentioned, um, Andres, you know, with vertical integration and with each of these companies sort of, um, you know, siloed and, and buying back all their, all their own content, it doesn't leave much for, for the Amazons and the Apples to, to actually uh, get a hold of. Do you think that that vertical integration is going to become a concern for people in DC and like regulators? Is that? I see Tara shaking her head. <laughs> yes, maybe. potentially. I think the, the, the other thing though, is there, there are, I mean, what do we have? Seven, eight, major companies now i think if you start seeing other um you know mergers then then i think that's a bigger issue i think where it is where it stands right now it seems like there are still options you know we talked about how many different services we're all having to d decide you know if we want to subscribe to but um but i'd be curious if tara brandon you you have different thoughts I mean, oh, the, the Democrats are definitely, you know, putting a microscope on the tech giants right now. And I think that if they start to scoop up some of these weaker players, it's definitely going to turn into a bigger story of how, do you have to break up these companies or, or do something to prevent them from being too powerful in the space. And as much as we have a lot of options in streaming as a consumer, it's not really saving anyone money. And so I think that's where there's gonna be a little bit of a sticking point in this space is, sure you have plenty of options, but if you need to subscribe to all of them, how is your, is your bill outlandish at, at that point? And especially when you know someone like Comcast is also supplying your internet and charging whatever they charge for internet. So I think there is going to be a little bit of uh, thorniness around this issue to come as these mergers inevitably happen. So Brandon, I'm shocked at the hour. So you're going to get the last word. Um, <clears throat> do you have thoughts on on like the distinctive role that the the tech giants are playing in this space, the Amazon and, and Apple? Um, do you have thoughts on that? And and also, you know, you're sitting in DC. Is is this integration and the the, the marriage of content and distribution something that you think uh, we ought to be worried about? And that will, I mean, I, uh, there's a such a long list of issues that you know people in Congress and some of these federal agencies, concerns they have about some of these tech players that their streaming services might not be uh, top of the list, but is that might that become a, an issue like it did in the 20s and 30s when the studio system was, was dismantled earlier? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with what Tara and Bryn were saying. I don't have much to add, except, you know, I, I do think that, you know, over the past, what, five, 10 years, um, I think there's just been uh, more mainstream sort of conversations around uh, what these uh, sorts of uh, mergers are looking like and the implications of that um, in terms of content, in terms of the sort of stuff that uh, actually gets created. Um, and what Bryn was saying, you know, made me think of in terms of, you know, uh, Apple, um, Amazon um, studios like that, but in terms of, you know, how do they sort of, how can they try to differentiate themselves? I um, mean, you know, I think that's an animated question for, for a lot of these different platforms. Um, and when you don't start out with this just trove of intellectual property, <laughs> existing intellectual property, um, it, it becomes harder to compete. You know, like when Disney in December sort of announced, you know, all these different um, new like Marvel shows. And um, I think um, some, there, there's some discussion um, about trying to create more, you know, more Star Wars uh, sort of like series and spinoffs and things like that. Um, you know, I think it sort of gets gets at the point of, um, you know, what are, there's a belief and, you know, probably not unfounded belief that, you know, there there's existing sort of interest in these sorts of things. Um, so why not lean into creating it at the same time that sort of cuts against, uh, you know, people who want to take bigger swings, maybe be more ambitious um, with, with the types of stories um, that are being created. Um, but, you know, when you just have these sort of <laughs> these gargantuan companies who are able to just uh, keep sort of mining the same 
um, you know, in different ways, just putting different spins on, on content, you know, that that's going to affect <laughs> how, um, uh, other companies, how other platforms, how other stories are going to going to be able to to jump into the conversation and actually play the game. Yeah, no, and it's so interesting how the model right now is that we have to acquire these um, all you can eat buffets for for each one of these uh, platforms. And <clears throat> whereas I think a lot of us might want to buy, you know, uh, one show or one movie here and one show, one movie there. And, and then we have to play this game of we, we sign up for a period and then we try to move on as, 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 as was mentioned. And I, I, I still am kind of tethered to cable too. And that's mostly for news and sports. So I think that's another part of the puzzle that that'll be interesting to see how it plays out. Um, but I am uh, past the hour mark. So Angela will be very upset because that's, that's a big no-no. But I feel I, at some level, I feel like we were just getting started. There's so much to talk about and apologies that we didn't get to it all. But thank you guys so much for doing this with us. And hopefully we can do it again soon. Um, thanks. Thanks for everybody for listening in.